Welcome back. We'll continue talking about the blood vessels and start off with the capillaries here. So the blood has now flown from the arteries down to the arterioles and now into the capillaries. And so in terms of blood vessels, in a sense, you can kind of think about the capillaries as being really the place where things happen. And so this is where we're going to have the exchange of nutrients from the blood into the tissues and waste products from the tissues back into the blood itself and so we're going to move substances from higher concentration towards lower concentration from the blood we're going to send waste products from the tissues back into the blood following that same concentration product process there we're going to have oxygen moving into the tissues we're going to have carbon dioxide moving out of the tissues into the the capillaries there and so this whole process is there to allow for the exchange of material so we can get the the good things into the tissues and the bad things back out it's for the most part a passive diffusion so we're simply following the concentration gradients that are there um, the capillaries are very very thin and so when we look at most capillaries, and we do have several different kinds, if you remember back to that of anatomy. And so we had our continuous capillaries, we had our fenestrated capillaries, and then we had our sinusoids. The majority of them, though, are uh, continuous capillaries. And so we have our capillaries here. And the substances that are going to move through them are oftentimes going to move through and in between the cells themselves. They're going to find little pores for them to move through in order to get through there. Um, there's essentially nothing covering over them. We've got a basement membrane and that's it. And so it's very easily easy for substances to move in and out of these vessels once they're there. And so they're going to go from, if it's from inside the, the blood vessel, from a high concentration towards a low concentration outside of the the vessel itself and then vice versa for waste products and things that are moving back into the blood vessels that are there these capillaries are very small and so oftentimes the capillaries themselves are smaller than that of an actual red blood cell and so the red blood cells are going to have to be able to bend and squeeze and, and squish and move through them and so this is where the elasticity of the uh, blood vessels comes into play or in terms of the the blood cells and so our red blood cell here has to be able to squeeze through those capillaries in order to make it to where it needs to go and so here we see a nice little capillary running in between muscle tissue and so we've got nice skeletal muscle there and it's running in between the vessels themselves making their way towards the tissues and so nutrients are going to come out of those blood vessels waste products are going to go into them from the muscles themselves so things like co2 things like oxygen um, perhaps lactic acid if things are building up inside the cell um, that's there glucose coming in for the the muscle cells to be able to work the way that they should as well those capillaries are widely, widely, widely branched. And so a huge amount of branching inside them um, to the point where any one given cell is no more than a hundredth of a centimeter away from a capillary. So we've just got this massive network of, of uh, vessels here. And it starts to make sense as well when we start to look at things like blood pressure, how the blood pressure just tanks as it goes into the capillaries. And so we go from a relatively moderate um, kind of a blood pressure as we come into a capillary bed, and all of a sudden it's going to go very, very low as it's moving through the capillary bed and then uh, out of the capillary bed itself. And so just making it so that all of those cells, all of those tissues have the ability to get what they need by taking the blood and essentially taking it from a large artery here and then splitting it up and here it's going into three different arterioles in this example and then those arterioles are further branching out even more that means that the amount of pressure that's here is going to go down which equals a decrease in blood flow 
And so blood slows way down as it's coming into the capillaries themselves. This not only is an occurrence for decreasing the blood pressure here, but it also is going to allow for us to do adequate exchange. We're going to be able to get the nutrients into the tissues and pull the waste products out. And so we're going to have plenty of time for diffusion to occur in those capillary beds themselves by having spread them out, by getting that huge amount of, of tissue there exposed to the blood vessels. And then it's going to collect back into veins. And as that venous uh, lumen increases, uh, it doesn't increase the pressure inside it as it continues along through the vessels themselves. In order to make sure that capillary beds are getting the amount of perfusion that they need, um, depending upon their needs at the moment as far as their, their metabolic needs, we're going to control the blood flow in and out of the, the capillaries and more so on the way in through smooth muscle sphincters. And so we're going to have little collections of smooth muscle that generate a sphincter that's going to either increase or decrease the flow into the capillary beds. And so depending upon the amount of blood that we have in there, we're either going to increase or decrease the perfusion of that particular tissue that's there. So if a tissue is doing its work, it's, it's doing its thing, it's got, an, in a sense, kind of a high metabolic need, those sphincters that are found coming into the capillary bed are going to be relaxed. And so there's going to be no tone in them in a sense, and blood flow is going to be allowed to move through the vessels. It's going to go out into the, the capillary bed itself, and we're going to perfuse that tissue with all of the blood supply there. If, say, that, mu that particular tissue there, so say this is a muscle during exercise, we want that capillary bed to be nice and open and perfusing the tissues themselves. But once that muscle is at rest, and so now it's no longer working, it's had some time to, to uh, get all of its oxygen back and replenish everything, all of its oxygen debt is gone, now those precapillary sphincters can start to constrict. Now we're going to, to block blood flow going out into the capillary bed. We're going to decrease its perfusion, and the blood's simply going to move through this thoroughfare channel and onto the venous side itself. And so we're not going to have very much blood flow into there. You can see this process when we have somebody who has gone from a parasympathetic state into a sympathetic state and you look at their skin. They become pale. And that's because we've clamped down all of those capillary beds to the skin and now we're reducing the blood flow to it. And so the skin starts to become pale. It's no longer getting that same blood supply that it did before. The pressure going from the heart all the way to the venous side is constantly falling. And so there's a pressure gradient as we move from the heart towards the capillaries and then into the venous side. Our pressure is constantly on a reduction process. And so the capillary walls themselves have a high fluid pressure inside of them so on the if this is our capillary here on the arterial side we have a high pressure and on the venule side we have a low pressure and so as such we're pushing fluid out on the arterial side and we're going to pull that fluid back in on the venule side so we're going to have a high hydrostatic pressure over here. So we have a high hydrostatic pressure. Over here, we're going to have a low hydrostatic pressure, a little bit lower, pulling that fluid back in. And so the overall net filtration pressure on this side is relatively high. And on this side, our net filtration pressure is low. And so it has decreased on that side, thereby pulling all of the excess fluids and everything back into that side of the capillary. 
Molecules are able to exchange between the two sides. And so primarily we're going to have a amount of water that can slip through the, the pores themselves that are there. So water soluble substances, water itself can make its way through those pores. Larger substances, um, whether it happens to be proteins um, or larger molecules in general, um, things like that have to go through and use exocytosis in order to make their way through. Um, this may be also utilizing where certain substances are bound to proteins as they're coming into the vessels. The majority of plasma proteins, the proteins that are floating around in the blood are going to stay in and they're going to be part of what draws that fluid back in. And so they're going to help to bring that fluid back in on the venule side of the system itself. Lipid soluble substances, they can simply go through the membranes themselves. So they can pass through those, those membranes as they make their way through there on that. If we have damage to this vessel wall, and so if we cause a damage here or uh, change my color here and say we create a pore because that vessel has been damaged there, now things like those plasma proteins can start to leak out into the tissues. And now this is going to, to not only cause the, the proteins to be out here, but those proteins are also then going to start to draw water. And now we start to get swelling, we start to get edema into that particular area themselves. And so the proteins are important in maintaining volumes within the blood and not in the tissues themselves to help pull those, those substances back in. From the, the capillaries, we're gonna move into the venules. And so now on the venous side of the system, we're gonna start to move from essentially the, the capillaries into venules and into veins. And as we go into the veins, we're starting to get a much larger diameter. And so here we have a relatively thin wall as far as the blood vessel is concerned, remember, back to your anatomy, um, but we have a very large lumen. And so very little resistance is found inside these veins. And so we don't have anything that's there um, to allow for the, the vessels themselves to, to really cause any kind of pressure that's there. There's a little bit of elasticity there. Um, they don't really have the, the same rebound that's in the, the arteries, um, partly because the pressure itself is a relative, almost in a sense, constant. And so the, the pressure, if we were looking at um, pressure over here and distance through the vessels themselves, that pressure is constantly going down and down and down. So it's a constantly diminishing pressure there. So we don't really need that stretchiness. We will have some smooth muscle there, um, but that's not going to, to really help with things so much. When we look at the whole system itself, we find that when we're resting and we're just kind of sitting doing nothing so to speak the majority of all of our blood is generally going to be found on the venous side of the system and so this is going to be helpful when we get up and we start to move around when we need to to have that blood back we have a, an ability to pull the blood back in um, on venous return and so we can allow for that venous return to uh, serve as a reservoir for that blood when we need it. And so we can pull that in from the vena cava whenever we need to have that increase in venous return that's there. There are a few things that are kind of changing the venous return itself um, that's there. And so there's a small amount of a pressure gradient essentially pulling in the blood itself um, that's being created by the heart itself that's there. From there, in order to get that pressure from those capillaries back to the veins, um, we then also have to need some pumps. So unlike the arterial side where we truly have a pump, we have the heart. On the venous side, we don't really have a pump. And so in order to get that blood back, we're gonna use outside pumps to help this process. And so when you think about it, in terms of blood, uh, one of the things that works against returning blood back towards the heart is gravity. So gravity is always working against us. And so gravity is trying to pull that blood through our vessels 
down further and further and further. And we can see this just by simply looking at, say, our hand. Um, as if our hand is below our heart, we may see the veins on the back of our hand start to kind of pop out. As we raise our hand up above our heart, we're going to see that the gravity now starts to help us and blood starts to drain out of those areas. This is also the reason why, um, say, at the end of the day, you may notice that your ankles or your feet are kind of swollen compared to that of, say, even your hands for things. And so we have this skeletal muscle pump. And so muscles, as they are contracting around deeper veins, they're going to squeeze those veins and effectively push the blood in one direction up towards the heart. And so that blood is going to make its way towards the heart itself. Making sure that it goes that way, remember that our veins have valves. And so the blood as it tries to push into these valves gets stopped and it's no longer able to move back through that valve. So once it's up above this region here, it's trapped. But once the muscle squeezes, it can then push it up through the next vein or into the through the next valve and into the, the more proximal end of that vein. And now the blood keeps moving up and up and up through the vessels themselves as it's making its way towards the heart itself, thereby counteracting gravity. The key here, though, is that the muscles have to be working. The muscles have to be moving. If a person is just standing in one place um, or if they're sitting in one place for a long period of time, those muscles oftentimes aren't contracting. They're just resting. They're not really doing anything, which means that the, the skeletal muscle pump isn't working. And so they're not allowing for that blood to, to be pumped back towards the heart itself. And so it starts to kind of pool in the lower extremities themselves. So getting up and being active from time to time, if you're, you're forced to be um, sitting or, or, or standing in one place, um, using those muscles, doing things like heel raises um, like this here, uh, going up on one's toes, contracting those muscles, forcing that blood up and out of the lower extremities is an important process. So again, just a little bit clearer picture here. Um, the distal valve, as blood is pushing back into it, is going to remain closed. The more proximal valve, the blood is able to push through that valve and make its way further closed towards the, the heart. And so as we then relax that muscle, blood is potentially able to still move up through that portion there, but any remaining blood in this section here is going to be stopped and not pushed through that uh, particular section of the, the vessels themselves. So we have a nice skeletal muscle pump. This can help to, to move that blood through there. And so it becomes a one-way valve. And so blood can move through. Once it get past the valve, it cannot make its way back into that valve and make its way through, unless that valve has been damaged. If that valve has been damaged, now we may start to get where the blood vessel itself um, starts to potentially bulge out here, and we start to get varicosities in the, the vessels themselves. And so we start to see damage there because of that back pressure that has been causing the issues there as well. Another way that we help with the movement of blood back towards the heart on the venous side is through the sympathetic nervous system. And so sympathetic stimulation here is going to uh, go to our alpha-1 receptors once again, and this is going to cause venous constriction. And so the little amount of smooth muscle that we have inside our veins does have the uh, ability to squeeze, and it's going to essentially push it back. And although they are uh, causing a vasoconstriction there, the veins themselves are big enough that they're really not going to add to the resistance of the blood that's there. So it's not going to, to cause a problem as far as increasing pressure or increasing the, the resistance within those vessels. The last type of a pump that we have is the respiratory pump. And so this relies upon the fact that as we breathe in and out, we're going to change the pressure inside our chest cavity. So in the thorax here, we're going to, to change that pressure as we breathe in and out compared to that of 
uh, atmospheric pressure. And so as we do inhalation, um, same kind of principle as that of the, the blood flow even, is that we're going to change pressure. And so pressure is going to be altered, either increasing it or decreasing it compared to that of the atmosphere itself. And so if atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, the pressure inside our chest cavity in order to do inhalation has to be less than 760. And then same thing for exhalation. If atmospheric pressure is again still 760, the pressure inside the chest cavity has to be then greater than 760 in order for that air to move out of the lungs themselves. And so as we change that pressure, lower pressure inside the, the chest cavity leads to more blood, blood pressure coming into the chest itself. And so blood is going to be drawn up towards the, the chest cavity at that point. And so we have a, a bigger gradient that there, the pressure has dropped even further within the system itself. And so once again, this comes back to similar slide that we had on the last time where we start to look at those changes in blood volumes and, and blood flow into different areas when we compare that of exercise versus rest. And so we see that we have these big changes in different areas of the body based upon the needs of the body in those particular areas at that time. Skeletal muscle demanding an increase in, in blood flow compared to that of rest. And so almost 10 times um, of that of what we started out with. Cardiac output, depending upon the amount of exercise and the amount of, of strenuousness that's going on there, this one's doubled all in terms of where we've started out from that of rest at that point as well. And that'll end our look at the, the blood vessels specifically. Uh, next time around, we'll start to look at the blood pressure in those vessels as well.